Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm going to try and do something this morning that I've done before, uh, and that is to preach a sermon about Lent. It won't be too churchy, though. It appears to be all right. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence here by your spirit this morning. We ask your blessing upon us. Bless our minds, bless our hearts, bless our spirits, bless our wills, so that we may seek to serve you better in days ahead. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, this is the first uh, the Sunday, is the first Sunday in Lent. Our Bible passage this morning is about the ways in which God prepared his son Jesus for his earthly ministry. So firstly, we're going to look at that period of preparation. Then we're going to look at how Christians in the past have tried to use Lent in order to prepare themselves for Easter. And finally, we'll think about how God is preparing us for serving him and what part we can play in that preparation. Well, it's reasonable to assume that God began to prepare the child Jesus for his earthly ministry from the very earliest times. God chose wisely in entrusting him to Joseph and Mary, for they were good Jews who were serious about their faith. And they will have ensured that Jesus knew the Old Testament and other spiritual writings. And they'll taken him to the synagogue. According to Luke 4, verse 41, Jesus was taken by them every year for the major festival of Passover. And he may have gone with them sometimes to other major festivals like Pentecost and Tabernacles. And we can see all this from the incident which is mentioned in Luke 4, when Jesus was 12 and he got left behind in Jerusalem. And where did Jesus go? Well, of course, to the temple, which was his father's house. And there he was found sitting among the teachers and asking them questions. Clearly, the boy Jesus already knew the scriptures well. And God, his father, had been preparing him in other ways. He already knew who he was and who was his father. And Luke records that after that, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So God was preparing his son. Now the ministry of John the Baptist was of course the prelude to the ministry of Jesus. Through the ministry of John the Baptist, God was preparing the nation for the coming of the ministry of the Messiah, his son, Jesus. And through John, God called to the entire nation to come for baptism as a symbol of their repentance. And Jesus came too, not because he had anything to repent of, but because God had called the whole nation to come for baptism. John recognized Jesus as being greater than him, but nevertheless went ahead with a baptism. And when Jesus was obediently baptized, a number of important things happened. Mark goes through all this so quickly that I'm having to borrow from other Gospels, of course, to, to, to tell the story. Firstly, 
the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the visible form of a dove. Jesus needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit for his earthly ministry. And if he did, how much more do we need that? Well, you may well say, but surely he was the Son of God. God the Son come in human form. So why did he need the power of the Holy Spirit? And the answer is because Jesus, although he was God in human form, had emptied himself of his supernatural powers so that he could live a life like us, which was fully human. And the human side of his nature had need of the power of the Holy Spirit for his ministry. The second thing which happened was that John the Baptist then knew that Jesus was the promised anointed one, the Messiah. John had been told by God to look out for the symbol of the dove coming down upon somebody as he baptized that person. And that dove descended upon Jesus. And from that time on, John began to point his followers to Jesus, saying things like, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And a number of John's followers we find from John's Gospel, including Andrew and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel and probably John himself, became some of Jesus' earliest followers. But something else which was important happened at the same time. In Matthew, it is recorded that a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. A further confirmation to John the Baptist and to those of John's followers who heard it, that Jesus was the son of God. But you may well say, that's not in our reading from Mark. And you'd be right. For Mark records exactly what Luke also records, that the voice of God from heaven said, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So God the Father had one message, I believe, for John the Baptist and for the crowd, and another message for Jesus. And the message for Jesus was a confirmation to Jesus as to who he was and what God the Father was calling him to do. And he needed to know that in preparation for his ministry. But both Matthew and Luke record that immediately after his baptism, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the desert or the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Luke records that Jesus was then full of the Holy Spirit. And Mark writes that Jesus was sent by the Holy Spirit out into the desert or the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. The desert here was of course the Judean wilderness. That is the area to the east of the Mount of Olives and which is going down towards the Jericho Valley, towards the Dead Sea and towards Jericho itself. It's an area of wilderness which dries up during the summer, it goes completely brown. But in the winter months, it's quite lush, and so, so shepherds and others can pasture their, their flocks there during the winter months. But there is always water there in deep streams in the rock. It's exactly the same place as John the Baptist had gone in preparation for his ministry. So what is God doing here? He is preparing Jesus in a new way for his imminent earthly ministry. Those 40 days were time for prayer and meditation, but they were also a time for learning how to recognize the voice of the enemy, the voice of Satan, as opposed to the voice of God. And it was also a time of fasting. We know that because we find in the accounts of the first temptation that Jesus was hungry. There was plenty of water, 
in the wilderness, but not food. Now, Mark does not mention in detail the three forms of temptation. I'm going to have to borrow the detail from other Gospels. Each temptation was a temptation to use spiritual power for his own benefit. And Jesus refused to do this. And throughout his ministry, he refused to do this. His ministry was for the benefit of others and was always to be exercised in accordance with the will of the Father. However, the second and third temptations were slightly different. They were temptations to bypass the pathway which the Father had chosen for Jesus. A pathway which would involve opposition and struggle and ultimately rejection and suffering and death. Jesus knew that he was indeed the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world and that the cross was his appointed route to glory. So, when the devil tempted him to do some strange miracle, throwing himself down from the very top of the temple and being rescued by angels, or gaining political power with the help of Satan so that he could fulfill his purpose through worldly means, Jesus, in both cases, rejected this temptation to avoid the cross. And in all cases, Jesus rightly used scripture in order to counter Satan's wrong usage of scripture. So it was important that Jesus already knew the scriptures well, so he could counter with the word of God. Luke in Luke 4 verse 13 records that the devil then left Jesus until an opportune time. You see, Jesus had to be prepared to recognize the voice and the temptations of Satan. So he would be prepared against those opportune times. And so when Peter argued with Jesus that the way of the cross could not be for Jesus, Jesus recognized the voice of Satan, tempting him through his friend. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed, Father, if there is another way, take this cup of suffering from me. Was there not something of the temptation of Satan there? A temptation which he resisted with, yet not my will, but your will be done. And even when on the cross, the same temptation came firstly from a thief who said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. And then from the high priests and other rulers who mocked him and taunted him to come down from the cross and save himself if he was the son of God. In both cases, it was the voice of Satan again with the same temptation. But why are there 40 days in Lent? 40 is a symbolic number in the Old Testament. 40 years of preparation for Moses in the desert before the start of his ministry. 40 years of his ministry in the desert. 40 years of wandering in the desert for the Israelites after they disobeyed God's commandment to enter the Promised Land. 40 days of Elijah journeying to Mount Sinai in order to encounter God there. And Jesus tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. The Bible uses numbers symbolically. And the number 40 is used symbolically of a time of testing and fasting and repentance and preparation. Very often in the context of desert or a wilderness. So it was that Christians began to feel the need for a period of preparation for Easter. And they took Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness as their model. Lent was envisaged as a time for prayer and fasting and meditation and preparation. It meant giving up something in order to concentrate on the Lord. 
and on his word. And some Christians still find this really helpful. But it's not in any way essential, of course, to our Christian lives, because we can do that at any time of the year. Although for some, it's helpful at Lent. But what is essential to our living effective Christian lives? It is essential that we seek to continue to grow in our spiritual lives. Now, my uh, home group, or life group as it's now called, has been studying Philippians recently. And so when I started writing this, all the passages from Philippians we've read recently came back to me in this context. Philippians 2, verse 12, the Apostle Paul encourages his readers to continue to work out their salvation in fear and trembling. And he then continues in verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. In Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14, Paul writes of himself, and we were looking at this this last week, I think, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. It is essential that with the help of God through the Holy Spirit that we seek to continue to grow in our Christian lives. Uh, my late father uh, used to say of business life that if a business was not growing, it was probably declining. And so it is with our Christian lives. If we are not growing, then we are probably declining. So how do we grow spiritually? Well, we do this in a variety of ways. Firstly, by getting to know more about God and about the Lord Jesus and what they have done and are doing for us and what they want us to do and to be. And this comes primarily from reading and studying God's Word. Remember how important God's Word was in, in a practical way to Jesus in resisting temptation in the wilderness? And that's where membership of a now rebranded life group can be so helpful alongside our own Bible reading. Secondly, by getting to know God better in prayer, spending more time with God in prayer enables us to recognize when the Lord is speaking to us and when the thoughts in our minds come from us or from what we want or from other directions. And it seems to me that the Lord Jesus probably spent most of the 40 days in the wilderness in prayer as well as in meditating on the Old Testament, much of which he will have memorized and he learned to recognize the voice of his heavenly father and the voice of the enemy. Thirdly, by learning to worship God and the Lord Jesus, not just in public worship like today, but also in our own time of personal prayers. Lent can be a good time to start to do these things more effectively. But as I said before, actually any time is a good time. Always remembering in all this, as Paul wrote, that it is God through the Holy Spirit who is at work in us. And that without them, as Jesus said in John 15, we can do nothing in terms of our own spiritual growth. I want you to notice how serious Paul was about this matter of spiritual growth both for the Philippian church and for himself. He writes, as I've said before, that the Philippians should work out their salvation in fear and trembling. The Christian life is not a game. It is very serious stuff. It's a matter of life and death. So Lent can be an opportunity for a new and more serious start in our pressing on towards the goal to which God has called us heavenwards in Christ Jesus. I'm going to end with some other words 
of the Apostle Paul, also from Philippians, for, for a prayer. And this is the Apostle Paul's prayer for you this morning. And this is my prayer, that is Paul's prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Great prayer, that. Not mine, Paul's. <laughs>